thank you, Fintan, and thank you, Ten Ten Data, for hosting us. Um, I have been working for First Derivatives for about two and a half years now, uh, doing KDB for various clients, and at the moment I'm based in New York, uh, working on site. Uh, outside of work, I tend to dabble around with various different things in KDB, and one of the things I do when I'm bored is um, write small machine learning algorithms in KDB. Last year in September, I uh, managed to get FD to take in a draft that I wrote on how to implement a feed-forward network from KDB in a very short amount of code. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, Kev, uh, side. So, uh, I'm just going to start by um, sort of giving a sort of an overview of where feed-forward networks fall into machine learning. They're supervised learners. Um, in supervised learning, what we do is we take uh, a data set where we have a history of what the input would be and what the target output would be. So, for example, um, if we have a lot of screenshots of handwritten digits, we can map these to actual values, and then our input data set becomes the images, and our output data set becomes this is a 5, this is a 9, this is a 0. And what we want to do is we want to pick or design a model that will start with the input data set, pass it through some equations or some algorithm, and then map it to the output. And once we've got this, what we need to do is we need to optimize the parameters within our model so that we have accurate mappings to the outputs, and then we can use this to generalize and make predictions in the future for unknown inputs that we don't know the outputs. Okay? Um, so that's our goal. Our goal is to optimize our parameters and our weights in the model. Now, um, to move on. So what we want to do is we want to figure out uh, a motivation for using a neural network. And uh, one of those reasons would be if you've got a complex classification problem, like uh, what Google's been doing a lot of recently with their deep, deep neural network stuff where they're like identifying things in images and the like. So uh, what we need to do is just come up with some model that can figure out what is what within our image. Um, or going back to the handwritten data set, uh, yeah, this is a 9, this is a 0, and so on and so forth. So these are non-linear classification problems. Um, and to sort of examine why this might be difficult, um, if you look at a truth table, it's quite simple to go, uh, OK, I just need to just figure out the equation that will divide up um, our red and our blue on either side for and and or. But when it comes to an exclusive or truth table, there's no way I can draw a straight line that will decide whether something's going to be blue or red. Okay? So what we need is some more complex, complex model that will work this out. Uh, now neural networks are one way of doing this, but there are other ways. You can use complex machines, now you base learners and so on. But we're going to pick a neural network for this. Okay? So we start with the building block of a neural network, which would be a neuron. And uh, so a neuron in our heads would be a cell in our brains that has a number of input connections coming from other neurons uh, known as dendrites. And these pass signals into the neuron where we have some sort of chemical reaction that goes on. And this produces a signal that it then sends through an axon which will then go on to other neurons which will do their own uh, chemical reactions on the inputs. Okay? So we can model this quite simply using this, where our inputs, which would be external from other neurons or from somewhere else, which would be x, y, and z, these come in through different connections, and each of these connections has different strengths, um, a, b, or c. Okay? And then within our neuron, we're going to model the, the activation, the chemical reaction, by creating a linear combination of um, our inputs and our weights. So if we recognize inputs and weights as independent vectors, then we can just do the dot product and we get ax plus by plus cz. And then we just need to apply some sort of activation function or threshold function to this to produce an output. Okay? So for threshold functions, there are different functions we can use. Um, I have here two functions. Uh, on the left is the sigmoid function. This is a fairly old um, and commonly used function in older neural networks. Um, original feedforward networks use 
something like this. It's, it's pretty neat because um, it constrains the output values between 0 and 1. And it's also continuous, so it's got a nice derivative, which is itself times itself minus 1. On the other side, I've got um, a rectified linear unit uh, function, which, as far as I'm aware, is what more of the modern deep nets try to use. Uh, so that's the blue line here on this uh, plot, which, as you can see, has a discontinuity at 0, which makes it a little bit difficult to work with. But what we can do is use something called the soft plus function, which is a nice smooth approximation to the rectified linear unit. And another nice thing about this function is that uh, its derivative is the sigmoid function. Okay? So that's nice to work with when you're being practical. Um, for the rest of the sort of presentation, I'm just going to stick with the sigmoid function, but uh, you, you can substitute where necessary. Okay? So if we take what we know now about these neurons, <coughs> We can arrange them in some sort of network. And this is a feed-forward network. So each layer passes on information from it, from what it received, onto the next layer. We we'll start with our input layer. So these can be external inputs um, from our data set, for example. And then each of these will pass on information across the connections, going through the weights, where in the hidden layer, we do our linear combination, and then we apply our threshold function. That produces an output, which again goes to the output layer as inputs. We do the same thing again at the output layer. Um, and then down here we have two biased neurons, which you don't have to introduce, but you can. These are sort of external inputs to the network, um, and they tend to just have a constant value throughout, uh, so you can just pick one. And their weights will change as you train the network. Okay? So, Given this, then it's just quite simply uh, a way of just taking these linear combinations and multiplying and multiplying and multiplying until you get to the end. So one way of uh, representing sort of physical systems is through linear algebra. What we can do is if our input data set can be represented as a matrix, like we have here, then we can say each column in our input matrix represents the inputs from each neuron. Then we can take all our weight connections and write them into a matrix as well, where each row corresponds to one input neuron, and each column represents one of the receiving neurons. Then it's just a simple matter of multiplying the two and applying the threshold function across the entire um, matrix. That is the result of multiplying. Okay? So you can do it all in one step that way rather than having to write individual neuron code and individual classes for your neurons, you just need to go A times B is an output. Apply sigmoid function, go on to the next layer, the next layer, the next layer. Okay? So bearing this in mind, it's quite easy to write Q code for this. Okay? So for one forward pass through the network, we take our parameters being our weight matrices V, which would be the matrices between our input and our hidden layer, and W being the weight matrix between the hidden layer and the output layer. We'll define a sigmoid function, 1 divided by 1 plus e to minus x. And then we do the hidden, okay? So in KDB, right of left, we multiply our input matrix times our weight matrix for our first layer. That produces a new matrix. We, multiply, we apply the sigmoid function to this which we'll, out, we'll, we'll apply it piecewise. And then we're going to add a bias node on here. So this is effectively just adding a column of lines to the output <laughs> matrix. And that's our output of the hidden layer. Taking this, we have a new matrix, and we multiply again by the matrix between the hidden layer and the output layer, apply the sigmoid function to the other elements. So that's the entire forward pass in KDB. Now once we've got this far, we can measure our calculated outputs against what we were expecting to find, and you probably notice the first time you do it, you have a lot of errors. You're far off in many cases. So what we need to do then, as I said earlier, is we need to find the optimal values of these weight matrices that will allow us to minimize this error. Okay? So moving on. How do we do that? Um, we do that by a technique called backpropagation. So backpropagation is a hill climbing or descending technique where we find the gradient of some 
function which is a measurement of our errors. So if you're doing regression, you might want to look at uh, sum of squared errors. If you're doing classification, you probably want to look at uh, cross entropy type of thing. And what we do is we find the gradient, or how, how far we're, we've changed. We multiply it by a little bit, just a, a, a small parameter here, so that it's like we're taking small steps up a hill or down a hill towards a minimum or a maximum. We add it to the former um, values we have for our parameters, and that will update it to a new one, which is slightly closer to what we're looking for as our minimization. Okay? And in the case of our uh, network here, what we're looking for is these two values here, the gradient of our um, error measurement with respect to the different weight matrices. Okay? So how do we find these? Because once we've got these, this is a constant we define ourselves, and we can move on and step through, step through, and continually get closer to our better error. So we're going to start with um, the weight matrix between the hidden layer and the output layer, because we already have our output. So the first thing we need to do is figure out an error signal here, which is how far off we were. And uh, the neat thing about, um, I guess, general uh, GLMs um, is that our error signal, if we're doing regression and we're using sum of squared errors or if we're using cross entropy, works out to be quite nice. It's just the difference between what we calculated and what we had. Okay? Once we've got there, we just need to multiply it by what we already have from calculating through the hidden layer. Okay? So that one's quite nice and easy. But once we've got this, we now need to do it for the next matrix here. So stepping on. Again, we just need to find an error signal at the hidden layer and we multiply it by our inputs. And that will give us our change along the screen line here. Okay? Now, the thing is that you have to remember is that this matrix here has some impact on the output here, right? So we need to include the whole thing when we do our calculation. So the first thing we need to add in is the delta from what we calculated before. And we sum across all the output nodes because this weight has an effect on this output but this output will affect each of these going down. So all the weights coming back through will affect this weight here. Okay? Is that, is that sort of clear? So we sum across these weights, WK, and the error signal, delta W here. And then we just multiply by the derivative of our function, that's our threshold function here, which, since we're using the sigmoid function, is just z, z minus 1. Okay? And that will give us our gradient and matrix. So given that, we can design our entire function for where. Okay? We start with um, some parameters, our input matrix, our target matrix or vector, our learning rate, eta, so it's usually a small number, 0 0.001 or something. And then our two weight matrices, v and w. We've already seen how to get our outputs, but once we've got our outputs, we need to figure out our error signal. Since we have our outputs, we just know it's our targets minus our calculations. Once we've got that, we need our error signal at the hidden layer, which, as you've seen, is the derivative of the sigmoid times the matrix multiplication of our output signal and our weight matrix flipped. We flip the weight matrix because we're going backwards. Okay? Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of black flips. And then, only in this case here, because I added a bias node at the beginning, I remove one uh, list from this matrix, because uh, the bias node, if you remember from the original um, diagram of the network, bias node doesn't feed backward into the layer beforehand, it's the external. But it still has weights attached, so we do still need to calculate uh, the change in those weights. Once we've got that, once we know our two error signals, we just then form a dictionary that has our outputs, our new weight between our input layer and our output layer, and our new weights between our hidden layer and our output layer. Which is quite simple, the outputs is O, and first uh, weight matrix is just um, 
the inputs times the error signal at the hidden layer, plus times the learning rate plus the old, old um, matrix. And then it's the same idea again for the next matrix. Okay? So that's it. And once you've done that, you just take this again, feed it in here, go through, feed it in, feed it in, feed it in, feed it in, keep going, and checking your output every, every step you go until you reach a minimum point where you're satisfied that your errors uh, are coming. Yeah. So yeah, that's um, that's the whole network in Okay. Um, now that can be a little bit slow if you've got very very large inputs. Uh, for example, the MNIST training data set, which is all this handwritten digits we're talking about. You have a very very large input matrix, so you're going to have a large weight matrix. You're going to have a lot of connections. You're going to have a lot of hidden nodes. You're going to have ten outputs. So all the matrices are very big. And in KDB, if you're using slaves, um, you can use uh, this function .q.fc to multiply across the slaves, and it will divide up your uh, left matrix X or, or A into chunks, multiply each of these chunks on different slaves through our uh, right matrix Y or B, and then it'll put them all back together again on the other side. So you will see a lot of speed up for large matrices, but if you do this on small data sets, then you're running into a lot of overhead trying to communicate back and forth, and you'll actually see a slowdown. Uh, if you want to take this even further, in KDB there is a variable called .z.pd, which is used for distributed computing, and you can extend it across slaves, and then slaves in other cores, and you can keep going across chips. And you can just spread it out that way as far as you want, as long as you have connection information between each computer. Um, and then, if you want to take it even further than that, and you're good at integrating, sort of extending KDB with uh, C++ or C, you could then move on to using things like LATLAB and BLAS algorithms, and um, maybe extend to GPUs through CUDA, and so on and so forth. Yeah? So if you have those already, then it's pretty simple to just Substitute uh, this for the other MMU operations within the uh, function for calculation. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the feed forward network. Uh, it's pretty rudimentary and pretty simple. There are much more advanced architectures out there today that are at the cutting edge of current machine learning. Google's blogs cover all of these things at the moment. But uh, there's just some examples of other types of uh, neural networks. You can get multi-layer feed-forward networks. So the one I showed here was just one middle layer, but you can keep going and you can keep going and then you just need to keep back propagating all the way. You just use the chain rule to figure out what your equation is at each stage. Um, convolutional neural networks are great for image processing, um, you know, Facebook space finder and stuff like that. Uh, so these operate by getting convolution of the matrix and then subsampling so on and so forth. Um, recurrent and uh, long short term memory networks have feedback loops and they have stores of previous versions of, uh, of their weight matrices. So they have some concept of memory. And then you have neat algorithms, which is sort of a combination of genetic algorithms and uh, neural networks. And then you mutate neural networks and you combine them to develop new architectures as you would with the uh, different genetic algorithms, okay? Um, so yeah, that's it. So just a couple of references. Uh, if you have any doubts about the maths, forward them onto this guy, because that's where I got the maths. Um, but these are all uh, fairly, fairly well described um, machine learning and general textbooks, but each of them all touch on neural networks. Mainly feed forward networks, but they sort of have a couple of paragraphs on the other ones as well. Uh, this one's the easiest one to understand. This one's like a PhD level grad level uh, sort of stuff. But yeah, so if you're interested in reading more about them, I recommend going through these ones. Um, and yeah, that's it. Uh, any questions?